In the next 60 minutes, uh, we're going to cover, oh, let's see, about 2,500 years of history and at least three continents. But we're going to begin with a word, and that word is genius. And it's a big word, and it's one we use sort of reverentially, and yet we also use a bit loosely. We're suffering from a bit of genius creep these days, right? Everyone's a marketing genius or a football genius. Did you know that Oral-B is coming out with a new toothbrush with, that utilizes smartphone technology to analyze your brushing technique? And it's called, of course, the genius toothbrush, right? So the question is, this is a big word, right? What does genius mean? mean? I'll tell you what it does not mean. Genius is not just somebody with a high IQ. We tend to think of well, genius is just a very smart person. Well, how to explain, say, William Shockley with an IQ of only 126, respectable but not stellar, who went on to co-invent the transistor and win the Nobel Prize for physics. Or James Watson, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA with an IQ of only 124. No, genius is not intelligence. So maybe genius is knowledge. A genius is someone who knows a lot. No. During Einstein's time, there were many physicists who knew more physics than Einstein did, but we don't remember their names. Because the truth is that genius is not a know-it-all. There is see-it-all. Einstein was able to make connections that the other, quote-unquote, more knowledgeable physicists we're not able to make. So is genius talent? And I realize that's the topic of this conference, and that's a word that you probably use almost every day in your industry, in your industries. Uh, and I'm sad to report to you that no, genius is not just talent. There's a great quote from a German philosopher named Schopenhauer, and he said that talent hits the target no one else can hit. Genius hits the target no one else can see. So it's that conceptual leap that defines the genius, not incremental change. And so really what we're talking about here is creativity. You can call it innovation if it makes you feel more comfortable. But we're talking about creative genius. And now we run into another problem. Well, what the heck counts as a creative innovation? You know, we, we don't necessarily know what it means. I like the criteria that the US Patent Office uses. In order to qualify for a patent, your device, your invention, whatever, needs to meet three criteria. It must be new, surprising, and useful. So, let's say I wanted to get a patent for my new coffee mug. Let's say I came up with one that was fluorescent orange in a hue of fluorescent orange that no one had ever used before. Technically new, not all that surprising, not particularly useful, and I guess you could find it in a dark room. Okay, no patent. Let's say I came up with a coffee mug that had no bottom. Okay, definitely new, very much surprising, not so useful. But let's say I came up with a coffee mug like this. Maybe a patent, I'm not so sure, because I'm not sure what's going on there entirely. <laughs> but the point is, you need to make that conceptual leap. The innovation must be new, surprising, and useful. And we get very hung up in this country on the novelty effect of an innovation. Is it new? Is it surprising? And we don't pay that much attention to the utility. By the way, that's not true in other cultures such as China, where creativity is defined much more by the usefulness and the utility of the innovation and not just its sort of shock effect. So that's our sort of working definition of creative genius. But the question, as John suggested, that I was really intrigued by is this. Where does genius come from? And here we run into the world of myths. There are a lot of myths and theories and partial truths out there about where genius comes from. Let's take a look at some of them. One myth is the myth that geniuses are born. And the sort of poster child for this myth is, of course, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, 
who was such a brilliant composer at such a young age, he was playing the violin at age three, composing by age eight, we conclude that of course it must have been genetic. He must have just been born that way. Ignoring the fact that, well, first of all, he had a sister three years older than him named Nanarol, who was every bit as talented, apparently, or more talented than him, but had the unfortunate luck of being a woman at that time, and that's a whole other story. And we ignore the fact that his father, Leopold, was the premier violin instructor in all of Europe at that time. And we ignore the fact that Mozart was born at a very musical time, 18th century, in a very musical city of Salzburg, in a very musical country of Vienna. Now, I'm not saying that he didn't have bring some genetics to the table. Clearly, he did. But psychologists now estimate that the piece of the genius puzzle that can be attributed to genetics is relatively small, perhaps 20%. There's another myth, and that is the myth that geniuses are made. Right? It's all hard work. 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration. You're probably familiar with the 10,000 hour rule um, that you have to put in at least 10,000 hours into a certain skill in order to achieve mastery, if not genius. This guy appears to be up to 25,000, so good for him. Um, partially true, hard work's important, but it's not enough. Look, there are plenty of hardworking people with good genes in North Korea right now who are not achieving the status of genius. So the more I thought about this, I thought, well, if geniuses aren't born, and geniuses aren't made exclusively through hard work, perhaps geniuses are grown. If you think about it, like trying to grow a flower, well, you need the seed, and you need a good seed. That's the genetics. And you need to water it and, and take care of it, and that's the hard work. But you also need the right soil. Without the right soil, it's not going to grow. You cannot grow a flower in concrete, no matter how good the seed and no matter, matter how hard you work at it. And I think this is something that we've largely ignored. We're so fixated on teaching creative thinking skills and teaching innovation and acting as if it was sort of divorced from the soil. So you step back, and something very interesting happens when you look at the world. You look at a map of the world, and if you were to plot the appearance of geniuses over time and geographically, you don't see them appearing randomly, one in Belgrade, one in Brussels, one in Scottsdale, Arizona. No, you see certain places at certain times producing mother loads of geniuses, good ideas, brilliant minds, genius clusters, I call them. And they're very pinpoint places, and they are not unique to the West, by the way. If you look at the map, you'll see that Hangzhou, China is on there. We could have added Calcutta as well. The West does not have a monopoly on genius. So what I set out to explore is I chose seven of these genius clusters from Time-wise, from ancient Athens to Silicon Valley, I chose some places that are pretty well known to most of you, such as ancient Athens, Renaissance Florence, Silicon Valley. Some that are less well known, like Vienna of 1900, Edinburgh of the 18th century. There probably would not be a United States of America if it wasn't for the brilliant minds coming out of Edinburgh at that time. Benjamin Franklin was a frequent visitor to Edinburgh just as, as one example. And then I chose some places that really are kind of off the map, at least for most people in this room, probably, um, such as Calcutta and Hangzhou, China, places of genius no less brilliant than Athens or Florence. So the question I set out to answer is, what do these places have in common, if anything? Let me put it this way. What was in the water back then, and can we bottle it, right? Are, are there lessons that we can learn for these places, from these places. This was more than just an intellectual exercise. I was looking for lessons to take home. And lessons, to be honest, because I'm not a genius. It's too late for me. Sorry, John. But I have a beautiful 11-year-old daughter, and it's not too late for her. And she doesn't live in the 18th century, so there's a chance. But I thought, how can I create a sort of microculture of genius in my own home, perhaps? Um, and I'll tell you one thing they have in common right off the bat is they are almost, almost all cities. So if it takes a village to raise a child, as the African proverb goes, it takes a city, well, maybe not to raise a genius, but to make a genius. 
Why might that be? There are exceptions, by the way, and one of them is Silicon Valley, but that is the exception that proves the rule. Well, Willie Sutton, uh, the bank robber, was once asked, Mr. Sutton, why'd you rob all those banks? And famously said, that's where the money was. Well, if you're a genius, you go not only where the money is, but you go where the people are. You go where the audience is. Cities are dense, and that is important, urban density. Why is it important? because you have more what's known as interaction opportunities. Think of it as you have molecules in a container. And the more tightly packed they're in, bouncing around and moving around, the more likely they are to merge with each other and to form new interesting compounds. Now, the urban density theory is not new. There's an urbanist named Richard Florida who's a big proponent of this. And I agree with him up to a point. But where I disagree is I don't think density alone is enough because prisons are pretty dense places, and as are slums, and they don't produce a lot of geniuses, seriously. You need to have an element of trust and intimacy as well. So they're all cities, with few exceptions. They all are these creative ecologies, and they all have a few ingredients. One of them is mentors, and this is hugely important. Mentors and patrons. And let's talk about one place where they play a huge role. Renaissance Florence. Renaissance Italy. So Florence is booming. There's all this art going on. And behind the scenes are the patrons who are funding it. So I want to disabuse you of the idea of the starving artist. No. Starving artists do not produce anything except their own misery. OK? You need to have a certain amount of sustenance in order to create, and you need backing. You need the right kind of backing. And Florence was very blessed that had a family you've probably heard of, the Medicis, who are bankers. That's how they made their money. But how they spent their money was on art and cultivating genius. And they were very good at it, because they didn't just spend their money willy-nilly. They spent it strategically. And they appreciated art. They recognized it, which is the key to being a good patron. And perhaps the biggest poobah of the Medicis was Lorenzo de' Medici, AKA Lorenzo the Magnificent. Um, that's really what either he called himself or others called him, but it was on his business card, so that's who he was. And he was a diplomat and a bit of a poet himself, but mostly he was a talent scout. And one day, Lorenzo is out and about in the Medici gardens, looking around, and he notices a young stone cutter, uh, can't be more than 14 years old, who's working on a, a statue of a Roman goddess. That's, they did a lot of Roman and Greek statuary. And it's pretty good. It's pretty good. In fact, it's very good. And Lorenzo, who's getting up in years, says uh, to the kid, that's not bad, kid, but you know, you made the teeth of this sort of uh, deer-like creature kind of nice and pristine, but it's an older deer. And, you see, when you get older, like in my age, your teeth don't look that way. And Lorenzo walks away. Happens to be passing the kid the next day and notices the kid has corrected it beautifully, masterfully. He has chiseled a little dump, gum decay into the teeth, and it's a beautiful statue. And Lorenzo, at that moment, places a bet. He says, basically, and I'm paraphrasing here, kid, you've got talent, or whatever the Italian for that is. Um, come live with me practically as a member of my family. I'm gonna give you the best materials in the world, the best teachers in the world, the biggest challenges in the world. And it was a gamble, and it was a gamble that paid off because today, that 14-year-old kid is best known by just one name, Michelangelo. Now, we know the name Michelangelo, and we think, yes, he was the genius. But maybe Lorenzo, the patron, the talent scout, was the real genius. Maybe the whole city of Florence was the genius. It's a different way of looking at creativity and innovation. And, uh, and speaking of talent, another great uh, Michelangelo story. I've got lots of Michelangelo stories. Um, a few Leo Larner stories too, but they're not as good. Um, and is that years later, the Pope, Pope Julius II, needed some ceiling work done in the Sistine Chapel. And he set out bids for contracts, essentially. He's looking for an artist to do it. And of course, he gets a lot of painters coming forth saying, I could do a great job with the Sistine Chapel. The Pope, by the way, is part of the Medici family. 
But instead, he chooses Michelangelo, who's mainly a sculptor. Didn't do that much in the way of painting. So in other words, he chose someone who was extremely talented in one field and gave them an assignment that was not a perfect fit and placed a big bet on them. Now, now we look back and we say, Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel, of course, obvious. Wasn't obvious back then. And I think that's something we can learn. You know, the, the idea of just hiring someone to do job X at your company because they've done job X somewhere else, that's not the way the Medici's rolls. That's not the way they rolled in Florence. Now, you know, he didn't choose a plumber to do the Sistine Chapel. Um, he chose an artist, but not the exact same kind of artist. Okay, let's fast forward, oh, a couple hundred years to Vienna of 1900. Now, this is a teeming city, again, a city, very densely populated, and it's got a few things going for it, which explains the just explosion of creativity in so many different fields. And one thing it has going for it is it possesses, both on a collective level and an individual level, the one trait that psychologists have identified as the most important trait for creative people, and that is openness to experience. It sounds simple, it sounds almost obvious, but it's actually very important. Having that openness to experience, having a degree of ignorance, in fact, is very important for the creative process. Because arrogant people think they know it all, they are not open to experience. Um, the other thing that Vienna had going for it is it was at a crossroads as the capital of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And this is another thing that creative places to this day have in common. They are crossroads, they are often port cities, they have this openness to the outside world, and they're not afraid to mooch, to borrow, to, dare I say it, steal ideas from elsewhere. So the great Athens, the cradle of Western civilization, was actually a city of moochers. They, the, the key to Athenian greatness was the port of Piraeus, because they would sail out to Egypt and Mesopotamia, see what the Egyptians were doing with statue making, see what the Mesopotamians were up to in, say, mathematics, bring it back, and as Plato said, what the Greeks borrow from foreigners borrow, they perfect. Um, and that was, that was the case in, in Vienna uh, as well. Um, this, this willingness to look outside of your own environment, to borrow, steal, whatever you want to call it, new ideas. So you've got this influx coming into Vienna, and a lot of it is immigration. A lot of immigration. I mean, at some point, a huge percentage of the city is made up of immigrants. And it turns out there's a big connection to this day between immigration and creative genius, okay? Um, Silicon Valley, in Silicon Valley, fully one half of all startups have at least one co-founder who is not born in the US. And that's not to mention geniuses who are immigrants such as Marie Curie and Einstein to name just two. So the question is why? What is it about immigration that might make the immigrant more likely to become a creative genius. Well, one theory, it's kind of obvious, is they work harder, right? They're hungry for it, they want it. Yes, that's part of it, but I don't think it explains the whole thing. The immigrant brings a different perspective. They bring in what's called an oblique perspective. They see things differently. They come from a different place. Um, there's this scientific, psychological term of what's called a schema violation. It's basically when your world gets turned upside down. Um, and in the lab, psychologists have done experiments where they try to induce a schema violation among people. So for instance, they might have them uh, make a sandwich backwards or have pancakes for breakfast or eat dessert before dinner instead of after. It's not a bad idea, actually. Um, mix things up temporarily, usually. And these people who do these schema violations, engage in them, are more creative. People who watch others doing them are more creative. And that struck me when I read about that is, well, that describes the life of the immigrant. Their life is one big schema violation. But there's kind of a multiplier effect um, when you have immigrants in your country, and, and that is this, I think. So say you've only used a fork and knife. 
That's all you've ever used. And all of a sudden, there's this guy from China who arrives in your neighborhood and he's using chopsticks. And you're like, wow, I did not know you could eat your food with those sticks. It looks really hard, but I had no idea. Now, you're very unlikely to start using chopsticks exclusively. You're going to stick with your fork and knife. But you have been opened up to the possibility of possibility. And I think that's the sort of multiplier effect that immigration has. In Vienna, one immigrant is, was Sigmund Freud. He was uh, an outsider in that he wasn't born in Vienna. He was born in Moravia. As a Jew, he was definitely an outsider. But he wasn't fully outside the system. And I think this is the key to an immigrant's success. They need to be what I call insider-outsiders. Outside the system enough to have that oblique perspective, but inside the system enough to affect change. And there are a few interesting things about Freud and, and, and creativity. Um, in addition to being an insider-outsider, he had lots of varied interests. He was not really a specialist. He had a degree in medicine, but mainly was involved in psychology, which is a very young field. And he had hobbies, um, as Einstein did. Einstein played the violin. Uh, Freud collected old archaeological ruins. Um, Archaeology was booming then, and you can go to his office as it's recreated, it's actually his real office, in Vienna today, and it's fascinating, and you'll see all these knickknacks, which is downplaying what they are, these artifacts from ancient Greece and Rome around his office, and they inspired his ideas, the Oedipus complex, et cetera, et cetera. Einstein's music he used when he was stuck on a particular problem. So one point I want to make about creative genius is they're almost never specialists. They almost always have that broader perspective. I really do believe that specialization is the enemy of creativity. Um, and a friend of mine over dinner the other night said, well, of course, you know, Eric, back then the world, w or the world was less specialized because it was less complex. But I would argue that the world is now more complex because it's more specialized. In other words, specialization actually leads to the complexity of our world and decreases the possibilities of, of creativity. Um, the other thing about Freud is that he was very lucky. And all creative people have a degree of luck. He was born in the right time in the right place. That's very important. He was born in a city where sparks, as I said, were flying in all kinds of different directions. There was a break in the air. And the thing is about creativity is it's contagious. Once there's a break in the air in one field, people start to think consciously, or as Freud would say, unconsciously, why not my profession? Again, it may not be a conscious thought, but I think it's important to live in an environment, to cultivate an environment where you're not just a one industry town. I do worry about Silicon Valley because it is mainly a one note town. It plays that note very well. But actually having more of the art scene, for instance, in Silicon Valley, it's not just a luxury, you know? It's not just a little dessert. Uh, having artists around you and people doing different things can create breaks in the air and lead to more creativity in your own field. OK, let's move on to another ingredient, messiness. This, as you may have noticed, is our friend Albert Einstein. And his desk was famously messy and he was a genius. Therefore, messy desks lead to genius. Actually, there's some truth to that. Interesting studies done recently where they would put people, uh, two groups of people, give them a, a task to do. Some people were given a pristine office. You know who you are out there, people with these perfectly neat offices. Others were given the same task to do to come up with ideas, some creative ideas, but in a messier office. And it was that second group that came up with the more creative ideas. Um, now, can we necessarily conclude that you should go home and you know, go to work the next day and just trash your office? Not necessarily. But why would it be that not only on that small micro scale of your desk, but on the corporate scale and the city scale and the country scale, a sort of messiness is important? You know, Orson Welles in that, that film, the, I think it was called The Third Man, if I have it right, um, he famously wrote a line about Switzerland I hope there's no one from Switzerland here, because he said, ah, the Swiss, 500 years of peace and stability, and what have they brought the world but the cuckoo clock? Um, actually, the cuckoo clock's a German invention, so not even that. But his, his point is well taken. 
If you're in a messy, even chaotic environment, you have varied stimuli coming in. You're exposed to more. And that's where real genius happens, I think, in combining the stimuli that comes your way. Um, and the other thing uh, about uh, messiness is it's more likely to lead to serendipity, happy accidents. Um, you're more likely to stumble uh, across something or trip over it, literally, if you're in a slightly messy environment. And even our brains need chaos, really. They do. Not all the time. That's not good. But sometimes. If you think about it, if you're trying to get from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things, you need to pass through a state that's a bit chaotic. We don't like to think about it, but we do. Physicists call this a bifurcation point. It's the boulder in the middle of the river. The river is flowing. It hits the boulder. It bifurcates into two new rivers. A lot of messiness around the boulder, but the result is two new orders. Neuroscientist named Walter Freeman a number of years ago did an interesting experiment with rabbits. Um, and I just want to tell you that no rabbits were harmed in this experiment, which I felt relieved because I'm an animal lover. No rabbits are harmed, but their little rabbit brains are hooked up to little EEGs, and he introduces them to, new, to odors, right? Now, some of the odors the rabbits are familiar with, right? And when they're introduced to those, nice steady EEG. But some are new odors. And then what happens is you see a chaotic EEG. This is what Freeman called the I don't know state, the I don't know state. If you think about it, it's hugely important for the creative process. You need to go through that I don't know state. And let's face it, we don't live in a culture that really places a lot of premium on ignorance, even though it's very important. We want to sort of get to the innovation and the creativity um, while skipping the I don't know state. And you know what? We can't skip it. So what do we have? We have mentors. We have a certain freshness in chaos. But we have something else which is discernment. And this is often overlooked because we place a lot of emphasis on creating open, tolerant places where all ideas are equally good. And the fact is, all ideas are not equally good. Some are good. Some are very, very bad. Um, and I think that's why these places of genius, these genius clusters, are not only Magnets for talent and creative people, they're also colanders, right? They sift out the good ideas from the bad ones. The, the poet Allen Ginsberg, and I say this as a, as a writer, he famously said, you have to be willing to kill your darlings, right? Those phrases that you're just so in love with, but don't really work that well. Um, this is why I think brainstorming sessions don't work, and there have been many studies that show that brainstorming does not work. But corporate America is in love with brainstorming, so everyone's like, we need to have a brainstorming session. Why? Because we just do. Um, in fact, it doesn't work, I think, because it's missing that discernment phase. You know, it's just all, all ideas are good. And you need to have the tolerance, you need to open up, but you also need to be discerning. Jonas Salk, two-time Nobel Prize winner, no slouch, was once asked by a student, Dr. Salk, how do you come up with so many good ideas? And he said, well, it's easy. I come up with lots of ideas, and I throw away the bad ones. And in fact, most geniuses, all geniuses, are incredibly prolific. But not everything they produce is good. Some of it is quite bad. But they're producing more of it, and they're moving on, and they're more likely to eventually have a hit. Uh, they're also, I think, very good at self-discernment, which is important. But really, these places are good at it. Creative places, creative cultures steer the good ideas in the right direction and hopefully not too painfully kill off the bad ideas. And that brings us to Silicon Valley, which I think um, I will say this was the hardest chapter in my book to write, because unlike all the other places, it's not dead yet. 
um, Silicon Valley, so the chapter hasn't closed. Uh, unlike ancient Athens, people, everyone has an opinion about Silicon Valley more than they do about ancient Athens. But I will say I think, I think it's misunderstood in a lot of ways. Um, first, on a very fundamental level, Silicon Valley is not about technology. It's not really about technology at all. Yes, the product is technology, but the process is a culture. It's a culture that leads to it. There's no technology, at least on the personal level, in terms of laptops or iPhones that exist in Silicon Valley that don't exist in Boise or Birmingham. It is the culture of Silicon Valley that makes it Silicon Valley. And that's why I spend a lot of time hanging out with anthropologists who study Silicon Valley as anthropologists, sort of the Margaret Meads of uh, Route 101 up there in California, um, studying it from a cultural point of view. And you find out a couple of interesting things. One is, it's not as new as you think. It resembles some of these places that I looked at in the past. It resembles ancient Athens and these other places in that they borrow ideas from others. Not all that much has been invented in the valley, really. Not venture capital, that came from New York. Not the cell phone, that was invented in suburban Chicago. So if things aren't invented there, what's the purpose of Silicon Valley? What makes it so great? Well. The Greeks borrow from foreigners, they perfect. What Silicon Valley borrows from others, they perfect too. There is a very efficient and effective ecosystem, a system for channeling ideas. So you go to Silicon Valley, you meet someone, and you have an idea, first discernment kicks in. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? If it is deemed, broadly speaking, as a good idea, you are connected with other people. You should talk to so-and-so, and so-and-so, and so-and-so. And, -so and, -so. and then the idea is accelerated. It, it's sort of a, a warp drive for ideas that may come from elsewhere. The other thing that Silicon Valley is good at is what's known as weak ties. So back in the 1970s, sociologist named Mark Grenevetter writes a little academic paper called The Strength of Weak Ties. And it went on to become the most cited paper in all of sociology. Very simple idea, though. That is that while strong ties with your spouse and your friends is good, actually weak ties with your creative community somehow is better because you have more of them. We're basically talking about Facebook here, right? And as Grinnevetter told me, um, Mark Zuckerberg didn't invent the concept of weak ties. He merely made it less expensive, right? He made it easier to have all, all these weak ties. And, um, and you're able to do that in the Valley. Um, also immigration, openness to experience. Um, as I said, half of all firms in Silicon Valley, of all startups, have at least one co-founder who was not born in the US. And you see a steady flow of new talent and new people and new ideas coming into Silicon Valley. The day that Silicon Valley decides to shut down and say, no more immigration, no more ideas from outside the valley is the day it dies, I think. Because although my book is mainly about how these places flourish, I do look a bit into how they end. And they all end essentially the same way with arrogance and shutting down. It's really different ways of talking about the same thing. That they decide that they no longer, uh, they know it all, they don't need new input, they don't need that freshness uh, and that leads to their decline. Also, uh, they become very interested in gourmet food. This seems to be, no, this is true. So I, I, I discovered that in ancient Athens, they're thriving, they're thriving, and there's this like, almost exact parallel between the decline of ancient Athens and you know, up until that point, by the way, they were not foodies. They were like, they had these really simple diets, and I even went to a restaurant in Athens that uh, is called Ancient Grefis, ancient flavors, and they've recreated this, uh, just like you're dining in 450 BC. So like they had no tomatoes back then, so there are tomatoes, um, they watered down the wine, there's no uh, forks because they only had spoons and knives. They do take credit cards though, that's like the one concession. And I quickly discovered, well, this is really bad food that these guys were eating and coming up with these great ideas. But then at some point they really got into gourmet food, and they declined. I'm not saying there's causation there, but we're all in trouble if that, if that is the case. Um, that what, that's what leads to the, the decline of these places. 
The other interesting thing about Silicon Valley is the attempts to replicate it. Um, Silicon Wadi, Silicon Oasis, Thames Valley in the UK, there are hundreds of them. And you know what they all have in common? They have failed. <laughs> they don't work. Um, and why that is, I think, is essentially people come there and often they're ministers from foreign governments, which is a problem right off the bat, and they say, well, we want the secret sauce. We want to know how we can put these systems in place. And really, more than a system, Silicon Valley is a culture. And cultures are organic, they grow organically, they're extremely complex, and they're extremely hard to simply transplant somewhere else. Having said that, um, there is no secret sauce. If there was a secret sauce, I would not be standing here. If I knew it, I'd be on my yacht in the Mediterranean sipping a drink with an umbrella in it. No secret sauce, but there are things I think that we can do. These, this is the, the bottled water, and, and this is the bottling of the water out there. There are things we can do to learn from these places. I call it the three Ds. I wanted to call it the four Ds, but I was told that three is a better number than four, but I'm gonna throw in the bonus fourth D here anyway. Uh, and that first is diversity. And I wanna tell you right now, when I say diversity, I don't mean ethnic diversity only. In fact, I don't even mainly need, mean ethnic diversity. I mean intellectual diversity. Now you can have people of different races, colors, and creeds, but if they're all thinking the way, that way, same way, you don't have diversity, but it is important to have that openness, that tolerance for other ideas, but, and this is crucial, you need that second D, which is discernment. You need to kill your darlings that are, don't, aren't quite living up. Um, you need to be a colander and not just a magnet. And the third D is disorder, and I realize this is a tricky one because if you're a city planner, or if you're a corporate strategist, even if you're the head of a household, disorder is not the first thing you want to introduce. Um, you, you want things to run smoothly, and I understand that. But I really do think a degree of messiness is important to the creative process. And I think cities, cultures, companies, or whoever who try to cultivate a creative environment without allowing for any disorder and messiness are going to fail. So the fourth bonus D is discomfort, which um, more and more I researched this, the more I, I really became to believe in discomfort. Here's the thing. All these places I looked at, from ancient Athens, even including Silicon Valley, are not necessarily nice places, right? They're difficult places. They were hard places. Athens was, they didn't produce much food as we determined that was very good. Uh, Florence was always at war with its neighbors. They're difficult places. And that's a good thing because we actually need something to push against. Creativity, I believe, is a reaction to a challenge, reaction to constraints, right? So there was an interesting study a number, done a number of years ago where psychologists took two groups of people and gave them the same assignment. Make a collage. These were not artists, but make a creative collage. Now one group is given lots of materials and lots of choices and said, go to town. The other group was given way fewer materials to work with and more constraints. And you know what? It was that second group that produced the more creative products. We actually crave constraints in a way. Robert Frost, the great poet, once said about free verse poetry, he said, writing free verse poetry is like playing tennis without a net. You know, we need the net. And as corporations and as cultures, we need to provide nets for people. We need to provide some constraints, which is really kind of another way of saying challenges, right? And that's why I frankly worry about some successful companies in the Valley where their creation story is always one of Hewlett and Packard in the garage, Steve Jobs was broke, you know, the founders, co-founders of, of Google were just a couple kids out of college, 
it was really tough, but then they create work environments that try to give their employees everything. And I understand that um, all free food and beanbag chairs can be very nice and ping pong tables, but I think it's also important to remember that if your company was created through discomfort and constraints and challenge to not eliminate those challenges. So if you've been sleeping for the last few minutes or the whole time and you want to know what do I really need to know, here it is. This is it. And I wish I had said it, but Plato said it. Damn it, Plato, beat me to it. Um, what is honored in a country is cultivated there. You could replace country with culture, with city, with corporation, with family, but it's the same idea. What is honored in a place is cultivated there. In 18th century Vienna, they honored music. They really honored music. There were audiences there pushing, pushing Mozart to do better, and they appreciated what he did, and they supported what he did. They honored it, and they got a Mozart. Now today we honor different things. And one interesting experiment I did throughout the research of this book is ask people a simple question. Was Steve Jobs a genius? Let's do it now. Was Steve Jobs a genius? We have yes and no. First, yes, he was a genius. Okay, no, he was not a genius. Uh, more yeses, but understandable. Often I get a 50-50 split. But what we're, when we're answering that question, we're answering Plato's question, really. What, are, what, what do we honor? What do we care about? What do we support? What do we cultivate? I just, it's a different way of looking at the creative process. Um, instead of focusing, say, on creativity training exercises where you treat creativity as if it happens in a vacuum and you just have to develop these skills that are sort of free-floating creative skills, um, you have to remember that it takes place in a context. You can't teach someone athletics. You can teach them tennis. You can teach them basketball, which, yes, does imply athletic skills, but the vehicle for those skills is very specific to a sport. And creativity is specific to a place and to a culture. And I think we can all, in fact, create our own geographies of genius. And I want to address the elephant in the room, or is it the gorilla? I can never remember. Both. I'm going to address the elephant and the gorilla in the room, which is, well, gee, we're living in a world where we can Skype and we can all this great technology. What does it matter, this geography of genius? We can be anywhere, and geography is so 2015, right? I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true for a couple of reasons. One, have you noticed that the people who are preaching this message that place no, matter, no longer matters tend to live in one place, Silicon Valley? So much of the venture capital and this ideas that aren't born there necessarily but are transformed there and processed there go through Silicon Valley. Why does it still exist? You could argue that it shouldn't exist if they believed uh, what they were saying, that it really shouldn't exist. And the other thing really here is that when I talk about the geography of deep genius, I'm talking about cultures, right? And whenever you have two people in a room, you have a culture. You have three people in the room, you have a more complex culture. And even online, you have cultures. Cultures, uh, hopefully, of genius, not always so. You can look at the online world and say, it's really like that world map I showed you in the beginning. Some clusters of genius, a lot of big, dark spaces <laughs> with no genius. But it really it comes down to how people are interacting. So I'll just leave you with these thoughts that we're all in it together. To think about creativity, genius, innovation, whatever you want to call it, a little bit differently. It's not that, oh, there's the talented, creative genius, and he or she just bestows this great work of art or technology on us, and we receive it. No. We are all, in a way, co-geniuses with them, because we are choosing what to honor, what not to honor, and we're choosing what to cultivate and not cultivate. And I think if we do certain things, if we follow the three Ds plus the fourth D, it <laughs> um, doesn't guarantee a genius cluster, but it increases the chances that you can see geniuses develop not only through good genes, 
and through hard work, but also, if we're lucky, we can grow a few creative geniuses. Thank you very much.